Well, good morning to each and every one of you. My name is Matt Young. I'm the senior pastor here on staff, and I just wanted to uh, bring a couple announcements to your attention. I appreciate you being here this morning. Uh, one is Family Promise is coming up. It's uh, October 29th through November 5th. Uh, the main thing we need this go around is folks to stay overnight. So if you have a, a need and a want and a desire, please reach out to uh, Lacey No and let her know that you can spend the night with our, our families that uh, are part of that ministry. The two other announcements, both of them are in the bulletin. If you open to the inside part of your bulletin, one is about the fall carnival, October 25th from 5.30 to 7. Um, I encourage you to uh, invite some of, the, some of your friends and family in the neighborhood. If you have grandkids, invite all your grandkids. If you have kids, and get them to invite some of their friends to be a part of that event on uh, October 25th. And then November 5th is our crop walk. Um, uh, um, Mackenzie Barnes is our youth uh, student minister coordinating that effort so if you have any questions direct those towards her if you have questions about fall carnival uh, talk to emily bell and both of them will be able to help you in that regard um, with those two ministry areas those are the primary announcements for you today if you are with us today in the room i ask that you uh, will sign in on the on the pew pad it's to your left or your right somewhere in the pew if you're online with us we welcome you and we're glad you're here today uh, if you're worshiping with us via facebook put in the comments section worshiping from Lexington, South Carolina or wherever you're worshiping from and we're glad that you're here with us today. Um, I've got Scott Sheffield on the schedule today. He is our finance chairperson uh, for a state of the church so I'm going to turn it over to him uh, to offer about our financial situation here. So Scott. Well good morning everyone. So thanks for allowing me the opportunity to discuss where we are financially as a church. So over the last three years, I've always promised to be direct, honest, and transparent with where our church is. The last time I spoke to all of you about our finances was back in June. Does anyone remember that? So through May 31st, we were $65,000 in the black. Now, at that time, I had what I would call cautious optimism. I spoke about how our strong tithing needed to continue through the summer months and not to, reg not to regress just because our church was doing financially healthy. Unfortunately, what I was concerned about the most became a reality. Our bare minimum tithing needed weekly, keep in mind that's just for the basic functions of the church, is just slightly under $22,000 a week. We averaged approximately $16,000 a week in September, $17,000 per week in August, $14,000 per week in July, and $19,000 per week in June. I'm sure you can tell that whenever the church misses our weekly or monthly expectation, that $65,000 that we were in the black will start to evaporate quickly. So let's look at where we're at through September 30th. Our need in total tithing needed to be at $852,000. Currently, we're approximately at 842000 So that's a difference of around $10,000. So yes, not only has that 65000 been absorbed, but we're also currently behind on our tithing. So over the last three years, whenever our church has been behind in tithing, our administration team has done an excellent job of controlling expenses wherever possible. This year is no different. They've stayed within their budget in all major categories. Our budgeted year-to-date for expenses is approximately $802,000. The team has spent that amount to stay flat. This is especially impressive given some of the facilities issue, issues we've had with our AC units. You know, those massive units cost tens of thousands of dollars to either repair or replace. But also keep in mind, these results don't include the $45,000 apportionments payment we need to make by the end of the year. So yes, the administrative staff is doing their part. Now it's time for all of us to do ours. So with total tithing and expenses, year to date, we're now in the red by approximately $10,000. And that's a $75,000 swing in the last four months. So what does this mean? It's very simple. The entire congregation needs to do these steps. First, pray. Pray for how you can help the church financially. Remember, every dollar counts. With pledge tithing, in 2022, if you committed to a specific pledge amount for 2023, 
See where you're at today. If you're on pace to make your committed amount, thank you. We appreciate that. If you're behind, please consider this a time to catch up. Please make this tithing or offering over the next two weeks. For non-pledged tithing, for those that didn't commit to a specific pledge amount for this year, please consider tithing on a weekly basis over the next three months. This needs to start today. It can't wait. The truth is we can't do it without all of you. My family and I have been part of this church for the last five years. And over this year, I've seen an excitement and enthusiasm that hasn't been there in years past. I've seen new ways our churches come together to worship, praise God, have fun, and give back to our community. I don't want to see this positive momentum subside. Constant and consistent tithing from all our congregation will help us to eliminate the debt, meet all our financial needs, and set us up for financial success in 2024. So for Pastor Matt, Barry Barlow, our church um, administrator, financial administrator, and myself are working on the budget for 2024. Our goal is to have it completed and passed by the Finance Committee and the Administrative Council by December 22nd. So as for me, being your finance chair for the last three years has truly been a blessing. I've been approached by Pastor Matt and the equipping team to take this role in the church again in 2024. I feel this is where God is calling me to serve, so I happily accepted. I'm looking forward to closing out 2023 being financially strong and getting stronger in 2024. So in closing, I'll read my favorite passage from the Bible about tithing. It's from Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 to 22. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so I return safely to my father's household. Then the Lord will be my God, and the stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of that you give me, I will give you a tenth. May the Lord bless you, your family, and our church. Thank you. Loving and gracious God, we're truly grateful for the ways that you bless our lives in every way possible. We thank you for the servants around the church that are able to, to clearly portray the state of the church. And we thank you for Scott and his life and for his family. And Father, as we begin this worship service today, may we worship you in spirit and truth, knowing full well that you called each and every one of us to this opportunity to worship the audience of one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Be with us in this time. It's in Jesus' name I do pray, and all of God's people do say, Amen.
As you are able, would you rise in body or in spirit for our call to worship this morning? The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and redeemer.
As you are able, would you remain standing and join me in the affirmation of faith as printed in your bulletin? We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in the true man to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by his spirit. We trust him. He calls us to be in his church to celebrate his presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life and in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. This morning is a great opportunity for us at St. John's Church to be able to welcome new members into the church. I told the first service that uh, I was lacking in membership, people that wanted to join for November, and now I've got somebody for November. So uh, uh, Pam's joining us today, and I've got uh, five lined up for December. So I think God is good. Can I get an amen for that? Uh, Pam is coming to us by transfer of membership from another local United Methodist Church, so she has two easy questions. And ultimately, these questions are asked of each of us every time that we have a baptism or any other time in the life of the church. So I want to ask Pam these two questions out of you. As a member of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? And as a member of this congregation of St. John's United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in the ministries of the church by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? She's a United Methodist. How about that? Can you give her a hand? <laughs> See, that was easy. If you'll just hang out for just a minute. Let us offer one another the sustaining power of Christ's peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. As you share the peace of Christ with one another, come and greet our newest member in the name of Christ and welcome them to St. John's. Thanks. Welcome. Thanks. <laughs> This morning, our epistle reading comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. Hear now these words. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever, we, whatever were gains to me, I now consider laws for the sake of Christ. 
What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes for God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, heavenward in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. And now for those children who would like to join Miss Emily for the children's moment, you are invited to come forward at this time. everybody. Good. Today we are going to talk about another one of Jesus parables. Do you remember what parables are? Yeah, what are they? A story. a story that Jesus tells us so that we can learn a lesson, right? So I have three balloons here. Do you think I can fit all of these in one hand? Yes. You do? Oh, oh. You think you think I can fit them all? Let's, oh, I got Oh. oh, no. Okay, let me try one more time. Let me try one more time, okay? All right, I'm going to try one more time. Let's see. Will you give me a second chance? To okay. I can't even get two on there. Okay, maybe there's two. Oh, can you put that one on top? Oh, no, no. How about these? How about if I hold these three balloons? Can I do this? One, two, three. Did I do it? It's easier because these are not filled with a lot of hot air like those. Thank you, guys. <laughs> because these are not filled with the same air that those are, so it's easier. In the parable that Jesus tells us, there was a landowner that let people lease his land. And it was time for the landowner to collect the money that the people owed to him. So he sent his um, slaves to go get what was owed to the landowner. And the people who had been renting. You did, yeah. And so they went to collect what was owed to the landowner and they hurt the slaves. They did not give him. And so the landowner sent, sent more slaves to the land so that he could collect what was owed to them. Hold on one second. So that he could collect what was owed to him. And he thought, well, if I send more people, they'll give me what is owed to me. But the people who had been renting the land hurt those slaves as well. And then finally the landowner said, I'm going to send my son. They will respect my son. I have given these people nice land for them to take care of so that they can earn a money and a living. They will respect my son and they will give me what is owed to me. But they did not respect his son and they hurt his son too. And Jesus is telling this story to the Pharisees, which were the leaders of the church. And he was telling this story to them because God gives us this world right, that we are supposed to take care of. And when we have Jesus and God showing us in our hearts how we're supposed to take care of it, and we're good listeners to Jesus, he shows us where we can go. But Jesus was telling the Pharisees 
that they had not been good listeners. And the Pharisees did not like that. They did not like Jesus was telling people different things about God than they were. But we know that Jesus told us the greatest commandment of all, which is what? What are we supposed to do? Love each other. Very good. So if we God in our hearts and we let God lead us to, be, to know what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to take care of this world, then we will be with God in heaven, right? All right, will you pray with me? Dear God, Dear God thank you for sending Jesus, thank you for sending Jesus to, tell us to tell us about your love. About your love. Help us to share that news, Help us to share that news with, others. with others. We love you. We love you. Amen. Amen. All right, you can head with me to Children's Church. Good morning. It is wonderful to be here on this beautiful, beautiful day. I'm hoping that you all have the same energy on this nice fall day as my dog, Abby, does. She was bounding all over the place this morning saying, it's a new day. But I don't think I heard Emily correctly, if I'm wrong. Did she compare us to blown up balloons? She did. I don't know. I've talked to her. We want to lift up the Rawls family at this time as we received word that Curtis Rawls, as you are aware, that he and Betty were moved down to Lexington to be closer to their sons um, sometime earlier this year. Um, this weekend, he was placed into hospice care. And so we want to lift up that family um, at this time again. We do have amazing God that loves us in the good days and loves us in the bad days, that encourages us when we are down, runs with us when we have energy, and laughs with us with some of the silly things that we do. And I imagine there are times that, and I don't know about you, but there are times that God is shaking his head going, oh, Jan, really? But this God loves us despite ourselves. And this is the God that we come and we worship this day. Please be in prayer with me. God of life, a God who loves us every breath that we take and every moment that we live. God who many days loves us despite ourselves. God who believes in this world even when at times we turn on each other. Forgive us, O oh God, for the violence that happens. Forgive us, O oh God, when we fail to listen or try to understand. Forgive us, O oh God, when our disagreements are more important and bigger than your love for us. We come grateful for each day of this church, for everything that happens within these walls and outside of these walls. 
We are grateful for all the people that hear your message and your call and for all the things that together we can accomplish. I thank you for the noise that these walls hold during the week from children and laughter and joy. I thank you that this is a place that we can gather when one has been lost and back in your arms and we can come together in our grief and remember together. You are an amazing God. And hear us as we come together in one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is that wonderful time in the service. We set aside intentionally to give back to God. Through the tithing that we give to God in, in gratitude, grateful hearts for all the blessings that we have received individually and as a church, and the gifts that we give to the church to help the many ministries continue to be present. So our ushers will come forward um, in the fashion that we're very familiar with, with the passing of the plate. And now with technology, you have your phones that you can use the QR code in the bulletin. You can use push pay from our website. And the U.S. mail still delivers. So you have that way as well. Thank you for giving so generously. Thank you for believing in a God who believes in you.
Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we know that every good and perfect gift comes from above. We give you thanks for the gift and the giver. And more than anything else, Father, may you use these gifts to touch people throughout this community and throughout this world with your love, your grace, and your mercy. It's in your Son and our Savior's most wonderful and precious name I do pray, Jesus the Christ, and all of God's people do say, Amen. As you remain standing, I want to offer a time of prayer. Uh, bishop John Johanna, Wesley Johanna, is the bishop of Nigeria. This past week, he was at home, which is his practice, and he had a home invasion. He had stepped out for just a moment, and his family was harmed but not killed. The intention of the people that went in the house was to kill the bishop and his family. But God protected both of them in very different ways. He's a bishop of Nigeria. I don't have to tell you what's been happening in the news, in the news cycle of, of that, um, Israel and also of Ukraine. What we forget, folks, is many times that they're united Methodists on both sides of these conflicts, both in Israel and also in Ukraine, from Russia and also Ukraine. And today we need to remember these spots on the map in your prayer time, your personal prayer time, 
but also in, in continued protection of the bishop in Nigeria. Can we have a moment of silence, and then we'll have prayer together, and then we'll jump into the gospel lesson today. So let us pray. Loving and gracious God, in the stillness of a moment, we know that you can speak. You can say, peace be still, and it happens. And Father, we look at the news cycle, we look at everything that's going on in our world, and sometimes we wonder, how long, O oh Lord, how long? How long to your return that we can see peace everywhere in the world? Father, for Joe and Wesley, Johanna, the Bishop of Nigeria, I ask for continued protection of his family. For a strong stand for Christ, we give you thanks. And for his living witness throughout the country of Nigeria, we just give you thanks that we see people come to faith in Jesus Christ because of his ministry in your Holy Spirit. For the conflicts that we see on the news cycle of Israel and that of Ukraine, we ask for protection of our United Methodist brothers and sisters in Christ and all those that you call to be a part of your church through your son Jesus Christ. We ask for a peaceful ending today in both of those conflicts where strife can end and new life can begin. And Father, continue to allow us to pray on behalf of those that cannot pray for themselves, those that are maybe in hiding today because of their faith. Let us now offer those petitions fully before you this day and every day. In Jesus' name I do pray, and all of God's people do say, Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from 21, 33 to 46. Now, the Wednesday morning group of men, they meet together on Wednesday. I missed it this week, but I heard their response to this particular passage was, huh. And I, then I had heard from the staff when I presented this passage to them the same response. So hopefully today you won't go, huh, like I don't really understand this one, preacher. But it's another story from the parable of a vineyard. The landowner is God, the vineyard is the nation of Israel, the tenant farmers are the Jewish leaders, the servant of the owner are the prophets of, all, of old, the son in the story is Jesus, and the new tenants are the Gentiles. Did you get all that? If not, I would encourage you to go back and listen to me again, make sure you get that. But let us hear the passage from Matthew 21, 33 to 46. Jesus is sitting before the chief priest and also the Sanhedrin. And he says this, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servant, and they beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent another set to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said to himself. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with those, those tenants? The religious leaders answered, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And Jesus said to the religious leaders, Have you never read in the scriptures? The builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. Marvelous in our eyes. And therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people who will reduce its fruit. Anyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone who it falls on will be crushed. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds because the people held that he was a prophet. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A little bit of context about this particular passage is Jesus was in the last week of his life, what we often celebrate in the church as Holy Week or the Passion Week. 
Jesus had had his triumphal entry into the city. The, the palm branches were raised up, loud hosannas, praise. And then he had the audacity to go into the temple. You may remember this particular passage, and he turns over every table of the money changers, and he says, this house is no longer a house of robbers, but a house of prayer. And then this will be Jesus' public, last public address, these last three parables that we've been reading. This is the middle one. And he offers it to the very people, if you can imagine, and maybe some of you can never imagine. He's sitting in front of the very people who will betray him, who will have him arrested, and will ultimately ask for his life to be sacrificed on a cross. What I began to think about in my own life is, what would I do in that situation? What would I do in the circumstances? And ultimately, what would the Lord of the universe do? Because in many ways, his last speech are passages to unpack. In many ways, it was his last teachings to a crowd. And I began to think about Randy Posh. You may remember the, the, the book entitled The Last Lecture came out on New York Times bestseller list back in 2007. And also he has a, a YouTube video of it and you can find it readily online. He was a professor at Carnegie Mellon. He was a professor of computer science. And he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He had surgery to take away the cancer had a Whipple procedure is what it's called today and in essence hooked everything back up and he went back for a follow-up appointment and found out that the cancer was absolutely everywhere. So like many professors and many times in the past, they have that opportunity for their last lecture, that, le that opportunity to offer what they had learned in being in the teaching profession. And so on September 18, 2007, he offered a lecture on really achieving your childhood dreams. And he offered some tongue-in-cheek commentary on the various dreams that God had allowed him to live and those that he had not. And then ten months later, he passed away from the very disease that he had gone in for surgery for. But for each of us, what would be the last lecture that we would offer before one another? What would be that last public speech? What would we want to say? What would it want to be focused on? And what would be that last speech before your family? When we hear this story, we often think about what it means to be towards the end of life. Some of us are closer than others, but we're only promised what? One day at a time. So we think about the religious leaders of this particular story and we wonder, did they really get it? Did they really understand what was at stake? Because we look at the story and we scratch our heads and we say, wow, look at the wickedness. And we only have to turn on a TV channel to see it in real life. But the wickedness of the religious leaders, because if you remember the first group that came, what did they do? They beat one, they stoned one, and they killed one. And then they sent another group and the same thing happened. So I asked the staff, I said, how many people were murdered in this particular passage? And they said, our best guess is six. And I said, that's a pretty good guess because we really don't know. But in essence, they, were accu they ac accused and led people away from God's call. They abused their power for personal gain. And each and every person that came to collect what was due in the vineyard ultimately were beaten, stoned, or lost their life. And in the very passage that's talked about today, the Israelite people had done that time and time again to the prophets. They'd killed the prophets of old just like they were getting ready to kill Jesus. Now there's one of three ways that we can take this passage. We can either build upon it, we can trip over the story, or we can be crushed by the story. Because if you remember in the story, it was talked about Jesus being the cornerstone that the builders did what? Rejected, right? We can build upon it in our life, understanding that Jesus is truly the cornerstone of our life. And my question for you, is he the cornerstone of your life? 
because you may not know a whole lot about cornerstones. I didn't have to read about this because I participate in mission camps every single summer that I can where my schedule allows. And there have been plenty of houses that I found on the ground because guess what? The cornerstone no longer existed. It fell apart or it no longer was there. And a portion of the house had dropped down or began to sink into the ground. And I can't tell you how many times I took a railroad jack or a 10-ton jack or a combination of thereof and began to crank a house up in order to put a cornerstone back into place. And sometimes I was lucky enough to have a couple bricks that I could actually use instead of a stone. But to build that corner of the house, to level that house, and to make it a home again for the people that I was working for. What about your life? Is your cornerstone placed on Jesus Christ? Because we can do one of two things. We can accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. We can confess our sins. We can ultimately turn our life and accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Or we can be like the religious leaders of the time and reject Him fully. It's ultimately our choice to do one or the other. To eternally be with Jesus or eternally separated. And you say, why in the world are you talking about this? Because the very people that knew who Jesus should be were sitting right across from him and they were plotting to kill him, to take his life. And for many of us here today, we're not plotting to take Jesus' life, but we're not living our life as Jesus as the cornerstone. Because the stone can be built upon, which is a relationship, it can be tripped over and we can fall apart or we can be crushed by it and ultimately the last judgment. For the religious leader, they were going to be crushed by it. Now what was interesting to think about for our, our time today and for our period that we live in today is there's 74% of people that l- believe in God. So three quarters of you here today believe in God. Think about that for a minute. 67% believe that there's a heaven. believe there's a hell. And one in four Americans, 25% folks, don't believe in heaven or hell at all. We've got a lot of work to do as a church. Can I get an amen for that? And those statistics are actually lower than they were 10 years ago. Let me read them to you just one more time. 74% believe in God. At least we got a point to start with, right? 67% believe there's a heaven and 59% believe there's a hell. And one in four Americans don't believe in heaven or hell at all. But there's a choice that we have to make as Christians that whether we're going to follow God fully and believe in His only Son, Jesus Christ, or we're going to fully reject. Those are the only two choices. And I don't know about you, I want to spend the rest of my life witnessing to my faith in Jesus Christ more than pointing people to the other place, which is separation from God. What's interesting in this passage of Scripture, if you go back to verse um, 43, and if you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to read it later in your reflection time. It says this, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, meaning the religious leaders, and given to people who will produce its fruit. In essence, Jesus is calling each and every one of us to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and he's calling us to bear fruit. That means for some of us, that means we've got a person in mind right now that, that is in our life that we need to tell about our saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I keep an ongoing list of those folks. I call it my impact list of people that I want to see come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And what's so interesting, out of the, the list of the original ten that I put on there, there's only one left. And I still pray for that person. I finally have an inroad and a relationship that I can finally get to that person. I've got to figure out how to do that and the right time to come about because I've got to go to Texas to do it. But each and every one of us need to decide for today whether we're going to believe in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And we need to decide today, are we going to be about producing fruit? Because the vineyard is, is, and the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And sometimes in our life we are denying Christ and how can we let go of those things that deny Christ and focus fully on Him? In 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5 it says this, As you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, in essence a cornerstone, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, 
You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood and offer spiritual sacrifices accepted to God, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So today we have a choice. We can follow him, we can believe him, and we can live out the call upon his life. Are you willing to do so? Are you willing to witness to the faith that you have in Jesus Christ? Witness to your family members, your friends, and those coworkers, and those people even on the golf course need to know who Jesus is. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we are thankful for your Holy Scripture, sometimes that is hard to unpack. But we know that you gave the ultimate sacrifice of your life, that we can have life and we can have life abundantly. Call to mind in us today those people that we need to tell in our life about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because we know full well that you've called us to do that. And help us to do that faithfully. We ask all these things today in Jesus' name and all of God's people do say, Amen. I appreciate your presence in worship today. I hope next week that you'll come. We're going to be talking about wedding feasts, so that's exciting to talk about anytime you can talk about a wedding. Appreciate your patience today. We're so excited to have uh, Pam Ellis with us today as a new member, and if you've been thinking about being a member with us, I encourage you to pick up the phone, call me at the church office, and I'd love to meet with you. I'm not going to ask for your social number, your first four children, your blood type, or any of those kind of things. I just want to plug you in so you can be a part of St. John's Church. With all that said, if to the person to your left and right, and let's close our time in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we are truly grateful for all the blessings that you pour into our life and all the ways that you make things possible. And for this church that we know as St. John, we give you thanks for her life and the life collectively that's gathered here today, both in person and online. 
Be with us as a church. Continue to watch over us and keep us safe. Call us to the people that you would have us to be in ministry this week and help us to witness to our faith in Jesus Christ faithfully this day and every day. It's in Jesus' name I do pray and all of God's people do say, amen. Go in peace.